This is part 10, named Mikates, which means at the end of. That is to say, at the end of two years, Pharaoh dreamed. And it covers 41 verse 1 to 44 verse 17. It covers Pharaoh's dreams, and the baker remembers Joseph, that Joseph was one who could interpret dreams. So he remembers him and he's in the dungeon. So Joseph gets delivered and, he, and Joseph interprets the dream successfully and he's made advisor or viceroy. He's second in power to Pharaoh in all, the, in all the kingdom. There are seven years of plenty, which is part of Pharaoh's dream, if you remember, seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of want. During those seven years of want, Jacob's sons arrive this is Joseph's brothers. They all arrive to, to, to get supplies for the family back in, 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 uh, in Canaan, as it was called then. Um, Joseph accuses Simeon, accuses all of them, I believe, um, of spying. And he, um, and he keeps, he, he arrests Simeon. And he also wants them, next time they come, to bring another son, another brother, whose name is Benjamin. He asks them, he says, have you got another brother? Of course, Joseph knows exactly. But remember, Benjamin is Joseph's full brother. He's the only full brother that he's got. All the others are half brothers. They've got different, they've got the same father, but a different mother. Joseph's real full brother, full blooded brother was Benjamin. And so he says, when you return, bring the other brother that you spoke of. What was his name? Oh, Benjamin. Yeah, him. And he's making out he doesn't know him, but he says, you bring him. Uh, Benjamin comes in this sidra, in this section, Benjamin comes and a goblet is planted in Benjamin's sack because uh, he's now accused of thieving. A kind of complex plan, really, that, um, that Joseph has either invented or God has inspired him to do for absolutely wonderful reasons, which we benefit from even today, of course because the whole family survives this, this, this famine and everything works out fine. Later on, hundred thousands, a couple of, uh, what, uh, yeah, a couple of thousand years later, thousand, one, five hundred, six hundred years later, the Messiah comes, saviour of the world, everything, everything's working out according to God's plan. So that's this section. Um, the thing I want to look at is, again, as we looked at in the last Sidra, it was the life of Joseph, the complete life of Joseph. Think of the life of Joseph again. We'll look at it again. Think of the life of Joseph as a roller coaster. It's kind of, a bit like many of our lives, really, a roller coaster of ups and downs. And the sages, the Jewish sages, say this. They say, note that Joseph, whenever he thought of himself, whenever he was thinking of himself, such as... Um, when he was uh, thinking of his dreams, his, his, his wonderful dreams that he had, and he shared these dreams with his brothers. Whenever he did that, whenever he thought of his own, his own attractiveness, and they say he was very attractive, was Joseph. And when he thought of, and he was getting proud about that, and when he thought of his own greatness to come, all these things, he fell. He's, his life, it's like a roller coaster, he went into a dip. I mean, he even ended up in the dungeon, really ended up into slavery. Why? Because he was thinking of himself and he was speaking of himself. And the sages say this was a roller coaster. He was on a dip. Now, when he thought of others, so he was serving Potiphar with all the with all the skill and ability and wisdom and, and, um, and integrity that he had. He was a great servant. He was serving Potiphar. And when he was interpreting the butler and baker's dreams in the dungeon, his life, his life rose. It got better. And remember when he was in the dungeon, it's an incredible scene, really, because he's in a, he's in a smelly, uh, damp, cold, I imagine. I'm imagining this or whatever. It was a dungeon. It was not a very nice place. The butler and baker arrive one day. They're kicked into the dungeon as well. Joseph's already there. Remember, he's got these iron shackles on him and his soul is coming into iron while he's there. <laughs> so they're thrown in and they look miserable one day. Well, who wouldn't look miserable in the dungeon? But Joseph notes this and he says, why are your faces downcast? And he hears all about the, the, the uh, dreams that they've had and everything else. But the interesting thing is, is that Joseph is thinking of others while he's in the dungeon. He's being sensitive to others. It's an amazing thing, really, and it's not to be missed in the story. So Joseph did this and he rose eventually in a couple of years it took 
thanks to the uh, the 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 the, um, the baker forgetting forgetting that uh, about Joseph in the dungeon, but he eventually remembered him, and Joseph's delivered from the dungeon. Praise the Lord. So. This is what they say. The story of Joseph tells us that when we think of others, our lives rise. When we think of ourselves, our lives sink. It's a simple story and it's a wonderful, wonderful lesson to learn. Jesus was the best example of all. And I just think of um, near the end of his life, he had been rejected. He'd been, he, he knew what lay ahead of him. He knew he was going to be crucified and everything else. He looks at Jerusalem, the very place where he should have been coronated where he should have sat upon the throne of David. He looks at it and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. But now it's too late, he says. It's going to be too late and your house will be left desolate. And he saw all these things in his prophetic eye. With his prophetic eye, he could see all of that happening. And sure enough, it all came about, of course. But the thing is this. Jesus' words are filled with compassion and sensitivity, even while he's going to the cross. And we remember even on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What an amazing statement that is for, for, from a man who's being crucified. He was showing us a principle, and the principle is this. If we seek to gain our lives, so we're proud of ourselves, we boast about ourselves, we seek our own comfort all the time. If we were Joseph in the, in the, in the dungeon, we would be so concerned with our little world, we wouldn't even notice the, the baker and the, 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 um, the, the um, what was he, the, the butler. No, <laughs> the butler and the baker. <laughs> he wouldn't have been, we wouldn't even notice them, you know. I mean, Joseph not only notices them, he thinks about them, he asks them a question, so on and so on and so on, and, and he helps them. So much like Jesus in this way. Jesus taught us a principle. Joseph's life teaches us a principle. If you seek to gain your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for his sake and for the love of others, you'll gain it. You'll gain it. That's a principle of life. A wonderful thing. Now think of it like this. We all inhabit a circle. We all inhabit a circle of our, some have got big circles of our lives, people who are known by many, have got public appearances and all the rest of it. Maybe it's a big circle, maybe it's a small circle. We're not, we're not known by many people and it's quite a small circle, a family circle even. Just whatever size circle, it's a circle because none of us are omnipresent, omniscient or anything else. Only God is, is present everywhere. Only God lives outside the circle. There's no circle with God. <laughs> there is no circle big enough. But for us, there is a circle. Now, the important thing is this. If you think of your life as a circle, the important thing is, are you facing into the circle towards the center or are you facing out towards the perimeter, outwards to others? And that is the key. If you seek to gain your life, you're looking inside, your life will gradually shrink and gradually you'll lose your life in a sense. And in another way, if you're looking out from that circle and you're looking to others, you're thinking of others, you're serving others, above all, you're serving God, then your life will increase, that circle will get greater. So that's really, that's really what happens. It's a simple principle of life. Look inwards and you shrink. Look outwards, you grow. Now, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 5, uh, Jesus said to Timothy, he said that some have a form of godliness but deny the power of it. It's a strange, strange uh, expression. How can you have the form of godliness and de deny the power? I believe it's saying all the right things but not really living a crucified life. It's saying all the right things. I mean, I can say these things now, but to go out and actually carry my cross is quite another issue. It's quite another issue. And it's, it's out there that you really prove who you are and what you believe. We are what we believe. We act what we truly believe. And it's about, if, if you, and Paul was saying to Timothy, some people speak all the right things. They've got the form of godliness. They go to church, they read their Bibles, they pray. They do all these things, but they deny the power. And the power is the joy when you carry your own cross. And it's not something we suffer. As I say, it's not something we endure. 
It's something we rejoice in doing. We count it all joy when we, when we find various troubles and we enter into various afflictions. We count it all joy because we know that in that affliction, there's going to be added to a self-control and love and joy and power and all kinds of things added to us because we're, we're ready to die to self and to live unto him. And later on, he said, some people are ever learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth is the knowledge of the cross and not just Jesus's cross, but my cross and to bear it gladly for his sake and to consider it an honor when we are called on to suffer together with Jesus, because that's called the fellowship of the cross. I believe that that's, that phrase comes from Philippians, the fellowship of his sufferings, the fellowship of the cross. What a wonderful thing. Non-Christians don't miss out on this. Learn to walk with Jesus and be blessed. Be blessed by Jesus. Amen. Amen.